Welcome to another in the series of the Tutor to You webinars. This time we're looking at social psychology, stereotype formation and effects. So first of all, let's look at what might seem to be obvious, how we all work with stereotypes. There can be positive stereotypes as well as negative stereotypes. We know straight away that's a baby girl, don't we? Because she's dressed in pink and that fits the stereotype. Just as Marilyn Monroe is dressed in pink and it fits the stereotype. And whoops, there's the single teenage mother and the teacher. And you can put your own stereotypes to the last couple of pictures. But the point is, we all do it. So you can start off with a picture like this for your class and get them to brainstorm adjectives, the first things that come to mind and demonstrate to themselves that we do all truly operate with stereotypes. Now, what can we use this topic for? Well, normally it's used to answer a short answer question that either asks you to explain or describe one theory or study on the formation of stereotypes or explain or describe one theory or study on the effects of stereotypes on behaviour. However, I want to show you how you can also use it for the options. When discussing cultural and ethical considerations in diagnosis, for example, you can look at cultural stereotyping, which of course affects the validity and reliability of diagnosis, especially the validity. You can discuss cultural and gender variations in the prevalence of disorders and how actually, again, some of this can come down to cultural blindness, cultural bias or cultural stereotyping. And of course, when you are teaching the development option, discussing the formation and development of gender roles, you can discuss psychological research on this or answer an ERQ to explain cultural variations in gender roles. Okay, so there's quite a lot that can be done. So if we move on now and just have a look at the formations of stereotypes. Now in social psychology, the theory underpinning the formation of stereotypes is really the social categorization theory. Stereotyping is a process of, well, it makes you a cognitive miser. It saves you thinking if you think in stereotypes. It doesn't take so much energy. You don't have to, every time you meet a person, start from the beginning because they fit in a certain box, don't they? Either the us box or the them box very often. So Tajfel's research into social identity theory through the minimal groups paradigm actually shows how we create us and them groups with the minimum, really, of provocation. Uh, there was a previous theory to this, Sharif's theory, that it was actually fighting for resources that put people in competition and made the formation of us and them. However, Tajful and Tajful and Turner showed really it was just thinking of ourselves as us and others as them that was quite enough to put us into these two groups. Perdue et al. look at how the language of us and them is enough to positively or negatively skew our thoughts. And then the actual process comes down sometimes to gatekeepers, media, family, friends, who help us create these schemas, and this is where schema theory can come in, about what a person is like if they look a certain way, or if they speak a certain way, or if they live in a certain area, or country, or of a certain ethnicity, or belong to a certain religious group. So the media, family, friends, our groups that we hang around with also control our image and information and control what is put out, disseminated amongst us for our views. And this can create an illusory correlation. This is Hamilton and Gifford's theory. It's a false perception of a relationship between two variables. Um, we don't go around raising our eyebrows and go, oh, men drivers. But how many times have you heard a man go, oh, women drivers? So false perception of a relation between two variables, women and driving and driving ability, can actually create a stereotype. There may be a tiny bit of smoke, as we say, but then 
This creates a huge blaze, which then becomes self-perpetuating and people don't think to actually look at the truth at the bottom of it. Here's an example of how to plan a short answer question. Describe one theory or study on the formation of stereotypes. Of course, the student will need to start with a definition of stereotype. Uh, there are plenty out there, plenty of psychology dictionaries that will give you a definition of stereotype. Okay. The study or the theory will require detail, require detailed description. So we've got Hamilton and Gifford's illusory correlation theory. It's a perception of a relationship between two unrelated variables. But then we look for examples, for evidence, for empirical backup for what we know to be true. So we dismiss counter evidence and counter claims and stereotyping occurs through confirmation bias and the principle that distinctive information draws attention. Hamilton and Gifford did do a study on this as well, which will soon be part of our key studies collection. So a nice game to teach stereotyping. It's a labelling exercise that I've adapted from something that was on the internet and the full reference is at the top there. So get the same number of sticky labels as there are students in your class and write a stereotypic attribute on each label. Try not to make them too negative and you control who gets which labels. So if you've got a very, very hard working student, make sure she or he is the one that gets the lazy label. And if you've got a very laid back student, make sure he or she is the one that gets the workaholic label, that sort of thing. As much as possible, try and mix and match the labels a little bit. Stick a label on the forehead of each student who agrees to participate. Stress it's just a game. Those who don't want to join in, who are made nervous by it, can be observers. And the students circulate and ask each other to talk for at least five minutes on their future plans. And they should treat each other in accordance with the stereotype on their head. So if forgetful is the stereotype, they could be reminded several times to check they understood the instructions. Then, after 15 minutes, reconvene the class and ask them to leave their labels on for a bit longer. Ask them to share how they felt, how they were treated by others, how the treatment affected them. And sometimes they'll actually mention not only their discomfort with being stereotyped, but also with treating others stereotypically. Invite anyone to have a go at guessing their label. And then tell students they can now remove their labels. And you have a series of questions here you can discuss. I'm sure you can think of more. Just see where the discussion goes. But these questions offer a very good forum to then discuss self-fulfilling prophecies, confirmation biases, belief perseverance, and other psychological factors involved in stereotyping. And it provides a great link into the effects of stereotyping and to the stereotyping of those with mental disorders, for example, in abnormal psychology. So, the effects of stereotyping. The most well-known one is stereotype threat. By Steele and Aronson, they looked at African-Americans who felt threatened when they were told that verbal reasoning tests would be a strong test of their intellectual ability. Koenig eagerly did the same thing with men. This was an unusual study because most studies into spotlight anxiety or stereotype threat have focused on minority groups or women, women being another example, of a group that feels as if it's in a minority sometimes, even if we're not, and seem to give the impression that stereotype threat really only applies to minority groups. But Koenig eagerly showed that men are just as sensitive as women are and as minority groups are to stereotyping and stereotype threat. Then Inslicht and Kang did a very interesting study into stereotype threat spillover. They said it's not just spotlight anxiety that causes people to be less successful in things when they feel threatened. It's also the cognitive effort that it takes to keep fighting against the stereotypes. When you're in a test situation, or maybe sometimes if you're living as a minority group every day of your life, and this cognitive effort when it is released, when you finish your test or when you relax for a moment, can spill over into other areas of your life. 
So the stereotype threat has a spillover effect into areas like acting aggressively or overeating. So this is an interesting study that we have a key study sheet on. And then spotlight anxiety. Steele argued that a result of stereotype threat is raised anxiety, and this is particularly true of minority students in academic settings and women in maths is the stereotypical one as well. And of course, these link to self-fulfilling prophecy and confirmation bias. If, as a woman who is only average at maths, which I am only average at maths, I sit a quite hard maths test knowing that everybody says women are not good at maths, then the pressure of trying to overturn that stereotype could well actually make me do less well than I would have done had I been less stressed. So I actually do badly in the test, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy and acts as confirmation bias that women are indeed bad at maths. So it ties in nicely. Looking at the options, once the students have relearned schema, how that affects stereotyping, have looked at social categorization and stereotyping, us and them language and stereotyping, it's then time to have a look at cultural and ethical considerations in diagnosis, where cultural stereotyping of certain ethnic groups, certain cultures, are likely to lead to overdiagnosis of certain illness in those groups misdiagnosis of other things and underdiagnosis perhaps of what they are actually suffering from. This affects the validity of course of diagnosis and if you discuss cultural or gender variations in the prevalence of a disorder, maybe an affective or an eating disorder, you can see that cultural stereotyping affects the prevalence. If we expect a certain group to have a certain disorder, we are going to overdiagnose that disorder in that group. Burst points out that cultural stereotyping with South Asian women led to an underdiagnosis of their problems, particularly depression. And gender stereotypes, Landrine points to the gender role hypothesis that says that more women are suffering from depression because of the gender roles they are pushed into. Again, in the options, if we look at development, Gender stereotypes, where do they come from? Leary points to the media as gatekeepers. The media puts forward stereotypes of gender roles in children and in adults, and children take them on. By the time they are two or three years old, little boys and girls are already aware of the gender stereotypes associated with being male or female. Fisk and Dyer look at stereotypes and schema, toys for girls and toys for boys and how girls will resist playing with boys' toys and vice versa because they don't fit into the schema. I've changed the heads on the models here. Didn't make much difference to the little girl because we're after all we're used to seeing girls in boys' clothes, but did make a slightly strange difference to the little boy, which we'll explore a bit more later. There's another game here for gender stereotypes, using a pink box for girls and a blue box for boys, cut up lots of small pieces of card, have multicoloured pieces of card, including orange, yellow, green, white, grey, and pink and blue. And do see if it happens that students pick out and use the pink cards for the girls and the blue for the boys. Just be an interesting reflection exercise afterwards. Encourage them to use the course material in their own knowledge and generate as many stereotypes as they're aware of for girls and for boys and put them in the appropriate box. You can suggest some phrases for them to get them going. Then give the boxes for the students to count and tally the stereotypes in a Google Doc or similar. This is really the beginnings of an inductive content analysis because here, as they do this, they will have to stack the cards into piles and split them into different themes. Things like appearance, voice, mannerisms, activities, subjects they're good at, this sort of thing. This gives you your main overarching themes for the stereotypes. After they've done this for both boys and girls, I usually give the pink box to the girls and the blue box for the, to the boys to sort out. Then get them to weed out duplicate cards and just put one example of each stereotype back in the appropriate box. And then count again. 
which box had most cards after the duplicates were removed. Whichever box had most cards is the gender for which the students were able to think of most stereotypes for. Which was the most popular stereotype for each gender? In other words, which one had the most cards before you weeded out the duplicates? Which particular stereotype? Why do you think this is? And a whole series of other questions. What does it mean to say that gender stereotypes act to exclude both men and women from certain areas of life? When do you think gender stereotypes begin to have an influence on children of either sex? I personally think the influence is different. While little children are aware of gender stereotypes, little girls will still climb trees and swing from branches and do different things. But when puberty kicks in, especially with girls who tend to put on a little bit of weight during puberty, then I really think the gender stereotypes also begin to hit home quite hard. And these very athletic girls will often pull back from the heavy physical exercise they were doing before and be more stereotypically female. And of course there are always some, aren't there, that break the gender stereotypes. I did a little internet search. Interestingly, it's much easier to find examples of men in the public eye who dress as women than it is to find women who actually take, fully take on the role of men. So I had to resort to a very stereotypical small girl on a motorbike. But always worth having the discussion again with the class about what they think about this. You know, How do they think this breaks the mould? Are they interested in countries where a third sex is quite accepted and where people will go around thinking of three genders rather than two? Can you think of other ways to break the stereotypes? Jobs, hobbies? What about the age stereotypes? How can people break those? And what is the role of comedy in breaking stereotypes? Andrew O'Neill, for example, worth getting a clip off of the radio of Andrew O'Neill. Andrew O'Neill is a very funny comedian. What is the role of this type of comedy in breaking the stereotypes? Day Maidner is probably rather dated for your students, but they might be interested in listening to an interview with Day Medner. And then finally, a glossary of terms. There are a lot more terms associated with stereotyping than students are at first aware of. So it's well worth giving them a glossary, cut up the cards and then make a blank set and get students in groups to write the definitions themselves and the relevance of the definition to stereotype formation or effects. And then you have a class matching exercise that's mainly been made by the students themselves. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's shown you how you can use stereotyping right through the course. And don't forget, there's another webinar next week, Wednesday the 16th of November, 8.30 p.m. GMT, focusing on the qualitative methods paper, paper three for the IB. And here's where to contact if you have any questions. Goodbye. <laughs>